Hey guys, it's YXBA here. Welcome to my next segment with legendary game designer Dennis Dyack. This was really my favorite segment because we got to talk pretty much exclusively about the Nintendo NX and the future of Nintendo and gaming at large. So without further ado, I take you directly to the interview. I really want to talk about and have a segment dedicated to the Nintendo NX or Nintendo's future. Yep. So there's been a lot of rumors about the Nintendo NX and a lot of the rumors have actually counteracted other rumors. So that's pretty interesting. Do you have any thoughts on why that would be? I mean, obviously there's, there's a potential that people could simply be making rumors up for attention, but what if they're not? Why, why do you think that there would be misinformation out there. Could you give me an example? It's really hard to okay. know what you're talking about specifically. So, Well, okay. Emily Rogers, for example, is she's a known insider, I guess, with, with Nintendo stuff. But at times she gets things right and at times she gets things wrong. And in any event, she had leaked out basically that the Nintendo NX is not going to be using... AMD, it's not going to be x86, it's not going to be Polaris, it's likely going to be about as powerful, if that, of the Xbox One. Whereas there's been a lot of other rumors and leaks and speculation that in fact it is going to be a little bit more competitive than that and likely x86 and somewhere somewhere between PS4 and the Neo in terms of power. And I have no doubts that there's some legitimate contacts that are are putting out two versions of what's actually happening wasn't she the one that worked at the treehouse or something like that she, i think she worked for like nintendo power or something to that effect but yeah. she may have worked at the treehouse as well so i so i'm not sure but let, let me let me describe why you should cast doubt on this source generally one nintendo is very insular and a lot of the times, things don't leave Japan, period. Information doesn't leave Japan. So there's a strong chance that much of what's being done is being kept so secret that many in North America don't know, right? And maybe that's not true. I don't know. But it's certainly possible. Also, linking information like this is, <laughs> especially if you're an employee of Nintendo, it can get really dangerous, from a standpoint of there are certain contracts and clauses where you can get in a lot of trouble. So I, I just, I question, I just question it. And I'm, I have no idea about her. I don't know her. I'm just saying in general, um, I would just, so as an example, if I was privy to X information, I would never, ever, ever, ever talk about it under any circumstance. It's just not what you do in the industry. Yeah. So especially if you're talking about a console where Nintendo intends to launch and you're, you're talking not a few million dollars here. You're talking a lot of money that's invested and potentially going to be a trajectory where they want to dominate the industry. So you're talking, you know, potentially billions of dollars here. So I would just question that source. And unless there's verifiable information, it's just a rumor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I, I, so go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say like, I, I feel like it's a bit of a strategy or it could be a bit of a strategy on Nintendo's part. Let's say someone leaks out real good, real solid information. I think the best way to draw attention away from that is to maybe have multiple false rumors circulating so that Sony and Microsoft, their competitors, and the average person out there really is confused at this point and doesn't know what to believe. So that kind of erases the legitimate leak that may have come out. Uh, anything's possible. But my understanding in general of, and just this is completely my opinion, I, I think Nintendo is focusing, frankly, on making the system as best as it can be. And they're, of all the companies out there, uh, they generally don't deal with rumors at all. They just don't comment. So I guess it's anything's possible they put up false rumors, but I find it unlikely that that's the case. I think the amount of different rumors that you're seeing is directly proportional to the interest 
on this system and what it's sparking. Now, I do agree that they'll probably Sony and Microsoft are trying everything that they know to find out about this competitor, which might, again, reinforce the reason why to keep it inside Japan. And it's really exceedingly important for the company that this information not get out. So I think there's going to be ex- like very strict firewalls and on how things are done. And, but I think like, certainly the heads, heads of certain groups would know. But if we're talking about someone who was a tester or someone who the chances of them knowing something are, I think are low. Indie devs as well. Like I think they're probably going to be the last ones to receive development kits because I think once you send them out to every indie dev out there, somebody's going to leak out some of the information. Once you send a single dev kit out, the competition will know. So everyone at Sony and Microsoft will know what they're looking at. I, I just think p- people spreading rumors is generally unprofessional. I, I don't understand why people do it. Um, I'm not a fan of rumors. And unless if you're not supposed to say, then don't say. And if you don't have any facts backing it up, it's kind of it's all speculation. And again, I- I'm not saying that anyone's right or wrong here. I just don't know. I'm just telling you what I feel the chances are of some of these things being true. And I, and I find it highly speculative. So I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not okay. putting too screens in it. So, yeah, I know it's as a fan, I like the rumors. Like I just, I want to get as much information. Sure. Potential, even if it's just potential information, mm-hmm. it always inspires me to talk about the what ifs, right? Like a lot of my videos, I don't even try to tell people whether this rumor is true or not. I just say, assuming this rumor is true, for the time being, even though it could totally not be, let's just talk about what that could mean. And it, just cause I find it interesting. And oh, so and I, 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 think... I like rumors for that reason, but I can see why as a employee at Nintendo or a, a third party company, you're really, you're really probably breaking laws if you're, if you're leaking things out. Yeah. I don't know about breaking laws, but you're breaking contracts. That's for sure. Yeah. And, and so I think it's a hundred percent fine as a fan of Nintendo to talk about it, I think it's great. I think it's actually very good for Nintendo and I think it's really good for the fan base. And I think it's really good to entertain all kinds of ideas and directions. And in some ways, this feedback could get back to Nintendo so they can see what people like and they don't like adjusting their course. And a lot of people misunderstand how long it takes to actually develop hardware and try to balance things out. But I remember in our podcast, you were very quick to shut down the VR rumors, which is great. So I think what you're offering, Colin, is a valuable resource to people who like Nintendo. I'm just saying for the people inside the industry, I just don't think it's a good practice. And, and But, you know, that's my opinion. So opinions will vary. Yeah, I mean, because I've been following Nintendo my whole life. And when Reggie started talking about the Blue Ocean strategy... And he actually yeah. said there was a book that it, that their new strategy was based on. The mm-hmm. first thing I did is I went to Amazon and I ordered that book and I read it because I'm just, you know, very interested in business side of games and the marketing side of games. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, sometimes, you know, like in the real world, <laughs> my brother, my parents, my friends don't necessarily want to hear me talking about Nintendo nonstop. And I think part of the reason why I started the YouTube channel was so I could just turn on the mic. No one's going to interrupt me. No one's going to change the subject. I'm just going to talk as much as I want about it. And <laughs> I think that's great, man. And frankly, the way things are, and I talked about this briefly in our podcast that you're on, but Nintendo doesn't play traditional ball. They're not a market driven company. So you don't see them throwing tons of money towards marketing and press the way a lot of other companies do, and they don't give out previews the same way. They don't follow the traditional rules. Uh, I say traditional. What a lot of publishers and hardware manufacturers do over in the West, and frankly, they pay the price for it, and and often they get much more harsh criticism than they deserve. And people are very quick to call and shout, shout down Nintendo, and I'm a huge fan, and I think... They have made consistently the best games in the industry, bar none. I can't think of anyone else. I think Blizzard is a great company. I thought they were a close contender. But overall, if you look at the number of games that Nintendo's done, at the quality that they've done them, I think they're unparalleled. There's no one can match them, period. can't think of anyone. And, and the fact that they don't play the traditional games of, here's this for a review, copy, do a favor here, or anything like that, you know, they often, they never, actually, they never catch a break. 
there are some really fair groups out there, um, but it's it's fans like yourself that keep Nintendo motivated from a standpoint of they know that they have fans out there. And when I hear your channel and other, it gives me hope that just because you didn't do maybe the most successful last generation, the next generation, because of your history and what you've done, you can really you know, change the direction and be very successful the next time. And it's, it's all about cycles. No one's perfect, but certainly Nintendo has been uh, super strong in that way. Yeah, like I find that I think Nintendo, when they've had a rougher generation, they tend to really go all out in the next generation. And I think that that's what they're really setting up for with the NX, uh, regardless of how competitive power-wise it ends up being. I think from a game standpoint, the first party lineup is going to blow away the Wii U. Now, I have a kind of a theory on what happened with the Wii U, and I would love to bounce sure. it off of you a little bit. I kind of feel like the Wii U ended up having to be a bit rushed to the market because I think that they were kind of caught off guard a little bit at the timing of when the Wii was going to start fading out in terms of popularity. You just don't really know. I think at that time it was such uncharted waters kept getting popular 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 and then all of a sudden it started to fade and i think i think what they basically ended up doing because i remember matt cast messina talking about this back in the day that nintendo was literally building two different consoles heading into the wii generation one was a more hardcore xbox 360 type competitive console and one was was the wii and what i think happened was that because they were kind of rushed to get the next product out there, they basically took the work they had done previously, updated it a little bit, and added the screen concept, which they had actually been working on for, for many years. It wasn't as well thought through, planned out of a generation as I think the next one will be. I think what you're saying could be possible. I think it might not be possible. Unless you're there in the room when the decisions are being made, it's, it's a very difficult thing to say. I think at some level, it's certainly possible that Nintendo could have felt rushed because of the drop off of the Wii, but it's also very possible that that's the system they wanted to release. And it may be, it certainly didn't hit the marks that I, I, at least one never knows what someone's thinking, but just hearing what they've said in the past about the console, I think it was a creative direction that didn't work out as well as they had hoped. I think think they're coming at this, it seems to me anyway, from just listening and parsing it in the background, it seems they're coming at this generation from a, a much more confident position. And where I'm really confident and looking forward to is I think it is going to be disruptive. I'm kind of excited to see what they're talking about because I remember Mr. Awada talking about it, saying that it was going to change things. And that excites me. That excites me quite a bit. Yeah. What can it be? What is the secret ingredient on this thing? There was, of course, the patent that came out about the kind of oval-shaped controller that had basically shoulder buttons, dual analog, and then everything else was touch, probably force touch buttons and so on. But I just think it can't be that. It can't be that, you know, because the whole point of virtual buttons is they're on like a device that you're looking at the whole time. You can't feel them. Fairly safe to say that their secret is not going to be on a patent that's released out there and everyone can read on, on their own. And, you know, if I knew, I wouldn't be able to say anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I really think that what they're doing is generally good for the industry. And they're trying to, they're not in a herd mentality where everyone is rushing right now towards VR. Everyone's doing VR, 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 VR. There's all kinds of investment in VR, there's all kinds of excitement, and I am personally very happy that a group is saying we're not doing VR. So we need more of that. We need more people going in different directions. Uh, maybe that's why we've always come along so well, is when we look at creating something and doing something, I don't want to do something that's already out there. Uh, I want to do something different. And I'd rather do something different and fail sometimes than doing what everyone else is doing all the time. I think that's something that, you know, Nintendo has done better than anyone else. And uh, I am, for me personally, I'm glad they're doing what they're doing and making great games for the industry. So, Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, so another thought that I had, and I, I wanted to bounce it off of you, 
because there has been some couple of instances where people have, are feeling like based on certain statements, the system is going to be like the Wii. There was uh, someone from Ubisoft said that they were confident that the NX was going to be able to recapture most of the Wii gamers. And people kind of took that as insinuating that the system was going to be targeting a real casual Wii-like audience. However, I don't think it personally means that. I think that, well, for one, when Nintendo is talking to third-party devs and trying to get their support on board, I think that they would be talking to them mostly about how they're going to be reaching new customers not currently found on PlayStation and Xbox, because that is what is appealing, right? Because if all they're saying is, well, we're going to steal away a bunch of PlayStation 4 gamers, and so they can buy their game on our system instead of their system, that's not a very appealing thing to, to say to to like a publisher. So they're focusing on where they're growing their audience, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't also compete more directly. That's very interesting. You said so much that there's so many comments I could make. <laughs> so I guess think about things from this perspective, which is probably a different perspective than what most people are thinking. Don't limit yourself to the console when thinking about what marketplace Nintendo is trying to get excitement in. So a lot of people don't know this, but the console market is fairly stagnant compared to the mobile market and other consumer electronic devices. So number of TVs have been has been growing, number of PCs that are sold to the worldwide has been growing, the number of tablets, the number of cell phones, all getting very, very large. But if you look at the number of consoles that have been sold, it really hasn't grown that much at all. It's in, re- in relative terms, it's stagnant. So, and I think when you look at Nintendo trying to capture a marketplace, they're looking at much bigger marketplaces beyond just the consoles. Because they have, like, I don't know what they're thinking, of course. One never does, but that's how I would look at it. And that's how I think most people are looking at it now. A lot of people are always wondering, like, why is this one group going into cell phone games? Cell phone games suck. At the end of the day, all of these areas are going to collide and merge. And we're going to have, when clouds are fully implemented and hardware becomes completely irrelevant, that's going to be, there's going to be one unified marketplace. And that's what Nintendo is probably looking to capture here. Yeah, I don't doubt that they're going to be going towards cloud computing at some point. But how, how does that look in, the, in in this future where, you know, okay, we're post-hardware and it's totally cloud-based? Won't there still be one kind of main provider or ecosystem or no. se- several different ecosystems? Like how, like somebody's got to have control, think, don't they? Well, there's a difference between the channels and the content. So the way, the best way to think about cloud computing is to think about cable channels right now. So the cloud itself is really, the hardware doesn't disappear. It just, it just moves away from what we use on on our day to day stuff. And it all gets, it's all provided through the internet and there's all of the central server behind a bunch of walls that we don't see, but think about it like Netflix. So there can be lots of clouds in the sky and there can be a Nintendo service where just like you subscribe to HBO, you could, you could subscribe to Nintendo. And then you'd get their entire library. You could subscribe to Activision, to Take Two, or to Rockstar, or whoever. And you can get all of their games, or pay a certain subscription price, or pay per game. However anyone's going to monetize it, that's how it's all going to work. And when you actually remove that from the equation, where you and hardware can be upgraded at any time, and specs almost become, in some sense, irrelevant, because you're constantly upgrading them to what your needs are, and they can scale and scale up and scale down, then you're talking about who's got the best software, who's making the best content. And if you ask me, if you were to pick between the part of Nintendo that makes hardware versus the part of Nintendo that makes software, I pick the part that makes software every time. And I think they dominate when it comes to video games. And I think when the cloud actually comes, that will be very, very, very good for them. Yeah. Okay. So, In terms of the cloud, though, do you not see any issues with gamers who don't want to have to switch models? Like Gamers sometimes revolt against certain changes, and I think Microsoft 
felt some of that uh, at the beginning of this generation when they wanted to eliminate used game sales, where gamers might say that, you know, I prefer a model where I can actually purchase a game and then I can play my game as many times as I want without paying more money. But on the cloud, the unfortunate part, I think, is that it costs the game makers money the more people play their game on a continual basis. No, I don't think that that's true, actually. Well, I guess what you're, what you're saying there is true, but don't, the cloud itself doesn't dictate what type of marketplace you have. So whether it's a virtual locker where you sell a game for one price, one time only for its inception and the person can go back and play that game anytime they want to the other side where it becomes not a commodity, but a service and you can pay for the service. The more you play, the more you pay. Mm-hmm. And we're talking less than pennies probably by the hour here for some of these things. It all depends. These are, are you going to go to microtransactions or free to play or DLC ink, vaults where you buy a piece of DLC and it's there forever? There's many, many ways in which you can monetize this stuff. And we say now that people are uncomfortable, but frankly, it's just a generational thing. What's going to sound really strange, maybe to some of the audience, but when I was growing up, there wasn't even keyboards for computers. You had to create these punch cards that you would put in where you program and you would buy your music in a store and there'd be records before there were CDs. And uh, the whole idea of streaming online did not even exist. And what's happened now, if you go into a record store, most of the population there is like, my age and above. And you don't find younger people in there because that's not how they listen to music anymore. And so what's happening when you, when you're saying that's really society just not yet adapting to some of the changes that are coming, but the younger generation that is going to grow up with clouds, they're not even going to know the difference. It's going to be the way it's always been. And um, as long as the marketplace can sustain itself, which means it can make money and you can sell things that the market will bear, then I think it will be successful. So um, it's it's a really yeah. good question, but something that's really got to do with demographics more than real problems. Yeah, but I think there's a few issues in gaming right now where it seems like the vast majority of the, at least when it comes to console games, a vast majority of the game sales seems to be going to an older and older demographic and the younger demographic is seemingly harder to reach with the consoles than it, it used to be. Well, that's because they're all playing uh they're all playing on their cell phones. <laughs> yeah. Which is why that market is so big. Yeah, no, absolutely. The console market, it's not in good shape. And I think there's a video on our YouTube channel, and there is, that actually shows basically a marketplace study of consumer electronic devices by Deloitte. And it shows this really, really tiny line, which is the growth of consoles compared to like cell phones and TVs and PCs. Yeah, all the younger audience has gone to those type. If they're going to play games, they're playing them on their, uh, you know, their tablet or they're playing them on their phone. And that is the marketplace that everyone's moving towards. When you see companies going to cell phone and mobile games, there's a reason. There's a reason why... You know, Classic Clans got bought for $9 billion. It's making a lot of money, much, much more than games that we think are huge, like Grand Theft Auto. Okay. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Well, I'm very interested to see how Nintendo does on mobile. I feel like, I feel like they're going to clean up. You know, they're going to make so much money on, on it, mobile, but uh, they will limit themselves a little bit because they don't want to infringe on their other businesses, right? Well, I, in some ways, it's probably going to become their business, uh, whether they want it or not. I think I think that's where the entire industry is headed. But this is where we left our podcast and where I think is a great note to have your listeners sort of think about this. Today, all the big mobile game manufacturers that I can think of anyway have not had more than one hit. So whether you look at Angry Birds, Clash of Clans, Farmville, you name all these casual games, each company has had like one mega hit, and then that's it. They have not been able to repeat it. And then you've got the old school groups like Nintendo who've had several hits. These marketplaces are colliding because they're all going to the same place eventually. The cloud's going to make that certain. But also the marketplace being as big as it is on the mobile space, it's you just no one's ignoring it anymore. 
regardless of what they think the quality of games are. So now you've got this group that's coming in with this huge library of hits that knows how to make successful hits over time. It's going to be very interesting to see who's going to do well. And I do think Nintendo's going to do well. I think it's it got a tremendous chance, but the answer is no one really knows. So Yeah, I mean, Nintendo is really, when you look at it, they were the creators of touchscreen-based games with the uh, Nintendo DS. And I think a lot of people have kind of forgotten that little bit of history that it actually... The DS was already a big hit before the iPhone came out. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Well, I think part of the problem, though, is for a company like Konami, who seems to be going almost 100% towards mobile, is no offense, but they're not necessarily known as being gameplay geniuses and in terms of making charming characters and stuff the way that Nintendo is. And they're ticking off their hardcore base of... Of fans, whereas Nintendo is, in my opinion, going to be better at making mobile games than Konami, but they have the added benefit of continuing to please their hardcore fans so that you have a situation where, I mean, they make a Mario game and it's on the iOS. Every Nintendo fan is going to spend the five bucks or whatever it costs on their phone. And so they, they have this base of loyal followers that are just going to do a little bit more Nintendo gaming now because because there's going to be games on their phone as well. I agree. Thanks for listening to this segment of my interview with game designer Dennis Dyack. If you'd like to hear more from Dennis Dyack, please check out his YouTube channel called The Quantum Tunnel. I will make sure to leave a link to it in the description below.